Good evening. <laughs> Thanks for coming out to Laura Plagevin's artist lecture sponsored by Cranbrook Photography Department. Uh, I will go in just a bit about the artist before we get started. Laura Plageman transforms her photographs through image layering, collage, and re-photography to reflect an experiential view of nature and explore contemporary issues in landscape and photography. Her work has been shown and published nationally and internationally, including with the De Soto Gallery, Gallery in Los Angeles, Pictura Gallery in Bloomington, Indiana, the Houston Center for Photography in Houston, Texas, and Lightfield Arts in New York, and is held in numerous private collections. She earned, her, she earned a BA in art history from Leslie University and an MFA from the California College of the Arts. Laura lives and works in Oakland, California with her partner and their two daughters. Uh, thank you for joining us and I will introduce Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Uh, thank you everybody. Okay, there's someone. Uh, thank you to the photo department for bringing me out here and to everybody who has worked hard on that job. Katie, thank you. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk mostly about my newer work and some projects leading up to that, but I also thought it was important to kind of have a journey through my kind of introduction to photography and how I got to kind of this place, because I feel like there's always threads, even though it might feel very different, we'll see. Um, so this is a picture I made about 20 years ago of my grandpa uh, in Stockton, California, which is a couple hours east of uh, the Bay Area. And uh, my parents both grew up in Stockton, and uh, my grandpa was from California and also Texas, which I'll get to later. But um, this was sort of the first photograph that I made that I really connected with as far as color photography. So I had uh, studied at Wesleyan, and I learned uh, black and white, and I you know, kind of grew up with photography in the dark room, and I loved it. I fell in love with the process of photography and kind of wandering and discovering. But it wasn't until after uh, college and I came back to the Bay Area and I started taking uh, non-degree classes in night school at uh, CCA to um, kind of learn, fill in my gaps, you know, contemporary photography education and color. So I got really into color photography and um, the CCA community was, was wonderful. I was working with, uh, I took classes from Todd Heido and uh, Chris Johnson and Christopher Russell, and I was learning a lot about photography and space. And I think um, I eventually started assisting for Todd, but what I learned from him, and I always like to kind of talk about mentorship and community, is just kind of to trust my intuition with photography. He had this very, uh, or he has this very non-linear, non-narrative uh, non practice where you know he'll like go out driving around and kind of feeling where the photos are. And I was really into that mode of working, so I feel like we, we really gelled that way. But also just a sense of mood and lighting and color. And um, he introduced me to the work of Larry Sultan, who was also at CCA. Uh, and his, his project, Pictures from Home, uh, that he did in the 80s with his parents was really inspirational to me at that time. Which is kind of, uh, they're both more of a, like a formal view of photography. But there's sort of this kind of idea of documentary and stage that I was really interested in. And also Jim Goldberg, I worked with him and, and kind of learned a lot about creating an archive. And you know, he was very like fast and loose with shooting and really different. So it was like all these really different voices and different ways of working. And I think I took little bits from, from each of them and from being in that community. And, um, and I started working on a project about my grandma who had Alzheimer's and she was uh, moved into a care facility. So I started photographing in her home, her and my grandfather's home, and thinking about kind of what happens to our spaces and our things when we're detached from them, detached from meaning. So uh, that project led me into further work where I was photographing um, houses that had been um, unoccupied or kind of uh, the residue of human presence. And I was thinking about houses uh, and sort of the interior, exterior landscape. So kind of how you bring the outside in and the 
inside out um, and started photographing landscapes as well and sequencing those two together in sort of a non-narrative, non-linear way. And I was interested in like the, the colors of the, the, new, the new growth in the grass and like the marks left behind and you know, just kind of getting attracted to those colors and then going in these spaces and seeing um, you know, walls like this and feeling like there was this like psychic connection with this mint color. And I think I was really attracted to these like pastel, soft light, uh, really open photographs, like no, no deep shadows. Um, and then just kind of the traces that were left, you know, like this picture where the pictures had been that looked like a house and this crack. And so I was feeling like the metaphorical power of photos. Um, as I continued on that work, I got more and more involved in the landscape side of things. And I think I was also really influenced by a lot of new topographics um, photographers. So, you know, uh, Robert Adams and uh, Stephen Shore, Sternfeld. So, you know, I was definitely going out in the landscape and always attracted to these little things that I would find like a fence running through the water and like land issues, but also just started to realize that, you know, there was more um, beauty in them too, as far as like the mystery and like always imagining kind of what was, you know, down that river. And I worked really hard to get that water very green in the background because I just like, I started getting more into the, to the printing and, and that side of things and feeling like I sh could and should maybe have a little more freedom to create. Um, instead of these kind of rules that I had for what a photo was supposed to be, or how it was supposed to look, you know, very formal. Um, so I started, uh, around this time, I, I had applied to graduate school. This was, you know, a few years, I think it was 2006, 2004. So I started uh, graduate school at CCA, and I wanted to work with Larry Sultan and all my all that community, but it was really exciting because it was interdisciplinary, which I spoke to several of you about today, that experience of, oh, okay, I've come from this background and now I'm gonna kind of be in a new place and have different influences and different mediums coming at me, so um, I wanted to work on a new project, and it, around that time, my grandfather passed away, and my father and I decided to go on these trips to Texas to kind of get, get a little bit more uh, information about our genealogy. So um, these are some photos, some family photos. Uh, that's my grandpa as a baby in Shiner, Texas, which is a small town, about 2,000 people, uh, between Austin and Houston. And the town still pretty much looks like it does, or did in that photo um, at the top. It's, it's, um, it's an interesting place, and I, I made many trips back and forth but trying to, to figure out what I wanted to do with this project that felt really immense, um, and wanting to picture the family ancestral land that we had zero connection to anymore, no, no living relatives there, uh, just old photographs. So I started kind of photographing the landscape uh, and not finding what I wanted. So I would make these photographs in totally different neighborhoods. This is outside of Houston and I just was using them as stand-ins. So this is sort of a stand-in for this imagined history. And I also got really involved in photographing thickets and impenetrable spaces, thinking about that as a metaphor. So kind of, this was a, a site where our, my grandparents and great-great-grandparents, it went back like seven generations. It was pretty, it's interesting. This was a site that they had owned land and I went there to make photographs, and I didn't know what I was going to find, and I found like all this overgrown nature that I couldn't access. So I ended up making photographs of just this, this thicket space. And so back in my studio in California, back at grad school, I was making these pretty large prints of these thickets and, and trying to access the space and open up the space, and almost more like meditations on these prints. Um, but I wanted to kind of figure out how I could access them in a different way. So I was living with all of this material. I was printing, you know, it was kind of um, early digital printing. So I was using inkjet printers to make pretty large format uh, prints like we do now pretty effortlessly. But at the time, you know, CCA still had a 
color dark room. Uh, that's how I had learned with the chemical processing, and you know, so it was. Um, I was I was kind of alone in my pursuit of making these these kind of prints on paper. So they didn't feel very precious. They didn't feel like I had you know worked all night in a dark room on them and couldn't ding them. You know, they were laying around, and with the rejects, I started um, shaping them, and. I don't know, kind of deciding that I could create something different with them. So I, I kind of had them on the ground and I was moving them around and then I brought my four by five out and just started getting in closer and realizing how I could transform the picture a second time with photography. And that led to the work that I started focusing on and have been focused on for quite some time, <laughs> which I called the response series because it's about me responding to an image that I've made and kind of creating a physical response. Um, so this one is called Shrub with Doves and I have a, it's, a, it's a photograph of a, so it's a very large print that I kind of manipulated and let the, the weight of the paper kind of, I don't know, create these creases and, and folds and then it was relit so that there would be deeper shadows and um, of composed in a different way. I was also fond of like ripping things out and elements instead of um, going in and using Photoshop, which I was pretty good at doing. I just, I, I liked the idea of it being a, a physical remnant and seeing the process so that it, as a viewer, you would kind of approach it as, a, I don't know, seeing it as an image and an object. Having there be some tension between the, the surface and a photo as a window to, to the world kind of thing, you know, the illus illusory space. So, you know, I was looking at a lot of uh, different kinds of artists and I always uh, resonate with Richter and I love this kind of idea of these overpainted photographs um, where you have that tension between and play between surface and image. Um, and then also, you know, like these massive photos I was seeing in museums of, you know, Gursky which are very, you know, uh, seamless, digitally seamless uh, constructed views. But I think what I was responding to was this kind of disoriented, disorienting feeling and this distorted space um, and really was drawn to things like that while I was making this work. So this is one I made called Kudzu. And, uh, and I feel like the, the process of doing this kind of re-photography allowed me to create this more, more wild space that felt like more of an experience of being in the place in the South where I made this. Um, it was, uh, you know, the, the kudzu vine has taken over the South. It's, it's kind of a, a cliche, right? I'm assuming you all know that, but <laughs> uh, what I found interesting too was just, you know, like that it's an invasive species that was introduced in the 1900s and uh, 1930s, it was planted all around the, the highways to control erosion. So it's like, I've, I've always been interested in that sub, as a subject, kind of these unintended consequences that happen from human action. Uh, so the traces of human presence, but also like how we impact and, and in ways that, you know, they had good intentions. Um, and there are good uses for kudzu, but for me it was more of about, this photograph was more about that mysterious space of like wondering what's underneath and feeling like it's a, like a wave coming. Um, so here's a shot of me that will show some process. This is me making kind of tests. So usually when I re-photograph a print, I work with an even bigger, you know, 40 by 50 inch print or something because uh, it needs to have more detail in it in order to re-photograph it because every time you re-photograph something it loses quality, it loses like detail and I mean, there's, there's things you gain, like being able to see the, the creases and the ink rubbing off in certain places, but you do lose some of the, the crispness. So I like to work really big, but this was uh, me working on a test. I don't have a lot of photos of me making this work because it was kind of before the time when I felt like I needed to document my every move for the internet, so. <laughs> Here's the lucky one. Uh, but it shows, you know, I was working with my four by five camera and um, I think this was after graduate school and I was just, you know, in a, in a, at home using natural light and kind of sculpting the paper. I tend to work where I will make like a small change at first 
and just go back and, and I'm always looking through the camera because that's the point of view that I care about. You know, it, it, I mean, I'm moving around, but it's, I feel like things snap into place and change when you look through the lens, or in this case, the ground, ground glass upside down and backwards. Um, so here I was getting a little bit more into the physicality of the paper and playing around with like paper and sky and how it, um, the boundaries between the two. And some of the gestures I made were, were a lot more simple. And this is like just one rip in the paper, but I felt like it gave this completely different feeling to the space and the image. Which got me thinking more about my roots of where I'm from. I'm from California and born and raised in the Bay Area and uh, have, you know, like the 89 earthquake. I was, you know, in grade school at the time and have lived through a lot of earthquakes, but also grew up going on hikes in these places. Like this is in um, Point Reyes, where in the 1906 earthquake, this fence moved eight feet which helped you know, with the study of earthquakes, but that fence is still there. So there's these reminders in the landscape that are part of my upbringing and part of my life. Um, that kind of dynamic landscape, but then also just that feeling of instability and not knowing when the other shoe's gonna drop, so to speak. Uh, so the next iteration of this project was to kind of focus on California and on the coast. I decided to focus on the coast and um, this is in Pacifica, which at the time I didn't realize it, but this is actually, later I realized that this is the epicenter of the 1906 earthquake is this location. So that was just like a happy accident because I was thinking about things like that. And also uh, this is right along the San Andreas Fault. Uh, but I was also thinking about just the, the dynamic landscape along the coast. It's, uh, you can actually see the geology and time changing in a way that you don't always see it because you know geological processes are deep time right but you can actually see these landslides and this coastal erosion happening pretty quickly and i was also thinking about uh, photographs uh, as objects and pulling back a little bit to kind of see the edges of this as a picture uh, this is point lobos and it is a well photographed spot uh, by uh, Edward Weston. He photographed here a, a lot, not this exact spot, but just that whole area. And so I started thinking about all these really photographed places and how images shape our understanding of landscape and our understanding of being in places, what we're attracted to photographing. And so I, you know, same for this spot, McWay Falls. Uh, this is in Big Sur. And you know, if you look up McWay Falls, you will see a photo from this point of view, probably. And it's you know on the cover of a lot of magazines in California and stuff like that. It's an iconic view, uh, for good reason. It's a really beautiful spot. Um, but what I found interesting was just that it's one of those places you project yourself into because it's you can't hike down to the falls. It's not, there's no trail, it's not accessible. You're not supposed to. I'm sure people do, but you're not supposed to. And there's one pathway where you park your car by the, the road and you walk out this one pathway and it leads to about this spot and everywhere else along the way is kind of obstructed views. So this is the spot where everyone photographs. Um, so I just, I was just really connecting with that idea of how can you make a picture your own or how can you connect with that history of like oversaturation of images. And in my case, it was about kind of exploring the space of this photo and creating a different kind of world and almost like a little object out of it. Uh, in this case, it was kind of more about creating a space that's more alive feeling because uh, the space of a photograph doesn't always translate an emotion or an experience. Right, so being in this uh, coastal region with thousands of birds flying around, it's this like really wild, cacophonous experience. And then getting a photograph back that was, you know, a very flat horizon and it felt very far away. 
like, this is, you know, I, maybe I'm not a good photographer and I can't ca <laughs> capture that experience. Um, you know, I wasn't in the water, so. But um, this is the next best thing to me, actually, like being in the water and getting down low, was to just change my perspective and use the print as an, as an object to kind of get inside of. These are some tests along the way. So, you know, I tend to work on little tests to, to, and studies when, I'm, when I have an idea about a picture. And also just to see if a picture will, will be like something I want to continue on and work on larger. So just playing around with lighting and um, scale and then, yeah, the top left is like a scale test that I made of that picture. And also thinking about kind of, you know, atmospheric conditions and like having photos that are more like not a landscape, but a landscape, an internal landscape. Uh, I also started to work on some kind of ideas with collage and it's a little difficult to see in the slide. I apologize, I don't have a detail, but there, these pieces of the rock have been, um, I, cut up and put back together. I actually printed several versions <coughs> of the same photograph and cut them up and kind of, I, I, I played around with like dropping them on the print in different ways, almost introducing a little bit more of an element of chance. I'm thinking about like Dada, Dada um, artists who would use process of chance and like drop squares on paper and like that was the art. So I was, I was kind of playing around with like reconfiguring um, this C stack and there's repeating uh, patterns in it. So I was feeling a little bit more uh, interested in going in this direction. And uh, so this is a kind of a more simple collage as well with two images uh, physically cut out and put back together. But at, around this time, I also switched from my four by five camera to uh, a digital camera and was using a digital camera mounted to a robotic arm or robo robotic mount called a gigapan, where you can uh, you know, input how many pictures you want in each row and how many, there's like X, Y coordinates. So you know, this photograph that I made of um, the ocean with this rock on it was, uh, I don't know, maybe like 24 pictures or something. So I was using stitching software that would composite the, uh, the photographs and that's why you get these hard lines in the water at the bottom because water is a dynamic subject and it's not gonna match up perfectly, right? So I was really uh, decided to embrace that aspect of it. You know, with some I had gone in and tried to, you know, erase parts where they didn't match up, but I was, I was kind of interested in how it showed time. You know, it showed that progression of time in an image and multiple moments of time in an image. So it was sort of a, I don't know if it's like a breakthrough, but I kind of, I come back to this. Later on, this image influenced me. So uh, fast forward a little bit. Um, <laughs> this work is called Hudson. And uh, I was uh, invited to make work for an organization called Lightfield Arts in 2019 uh, in and around Hudson Valley, Hudson River Valley. They were doing a, they wanted the theme to be on climate change and also on tree science that had been going on in the area. So uh, the, I made this uh, photograph of the hemlock tree high up in the, the mountains, or it's called Mohonk Preserve. And the hemlock is uh, endangered because of the woolly adelgid beetle that's uh, working its way north from the south because of warmer climate. So this photograph uh, of this tree that I made uh, the tree may not be around in 10 years. I don't know that we're hoping that there, there's like breakthroughs and ways to treat the trees. But, um, but yeah, so I was looking and hiking around. It was like, it was hard to find these trees. It looks pretty scrawny, but it's actually, you know, like a 400 year old tree or 500 year old tree. Um, but when I was there, it was, you know, it was like, I was there for about a week went out to make pictures and I had a week and I was photographing kind of all day and looking around the, the valley for, for different trees and landscapes to shoot. But I wasn't always there at the right time of day 
or I wasn't able to wait for the good light or the clouds to roll in like I might have wanted. So I decided pretty early on that these photographs were going to be a combination of, you know, work from New York and then California. So they're, they're hybrids. I made them in studio and on location. So I was very interested in this romantic, sublime aesthetic of the Hudson River Valley. Um, and that's a photo of my daughter and I at the museum in San Francisco looking at these paintings. Before we went out there, I, I said, you have to come with me. We're going like, to go look at the paintings and have some art appreciation. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it was interesting because that we, we think of these as very picturesque, but the, the bottom left coal painting is really about his response to industrialization uh, with farming on the right side and then this kind of wild nature on the left. So, I mean, this was like, these are things that, that artists have been dealing with and thinking about for a long time. And I started thinking about how to introduce that kind of aesthetic of the, the Hudson River Valley, but also have it be a contemporary take on sublime and also like what our issues are with sublime and more about climate sublime. So I, I, back in the studio, I was using colored lights and um, layering with paper and the images to create these. And also working with spray paint um, to kind of create this idea of, you know, atmospheric haze and particles and light, but also in response to like reports about unhealthy air quality. And my own experience is living in California with the wildfires that have been going on every year for, I don't know, at least six years that I can remember. And having to wear masks for, you know, before the pandemic, having to wear masks for months at a time to go outside. So yeah, I was just kind of using the paint and the paper and doing a, a layering process to kind of create these just kind of change the mood of the original image. And also thinking about filters and how we tend to do that um, on social apps and how people will add like, you know, a rainbow to things to make it feel more cheerful. So that was my attempt at a hopeful future, but I'm not sure if that's <laughs> true. Uh, so this image on the right was one I made uh, for that project, but I, I didn't use it for the project because it didn't really fit in. It was a little bit more of an outlier and because it was, it was taken at Catterskill Falls. It wasn't really about trees. It was, um, it was more about the falls. And, uh, but what, that day that I was there shooting, I was uh, shooting from all different perspectives. You can hike up to different levels and you can you know, come at it from different ways. So I, I, I shot tons of photographs that day and um, where am I going with this? Oh, so yeah, so this site uh, is a pretty interesting, it's a, it's a tourist attraction, right? It's one of the oldest tourist attractions in New York. It's really beautiful. I'd love to go there in the winter. I've seen photographs of it all frozen and amazing. Um, I don't know, I, have, I romanticize winter more than <laughs> you all might. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I was there in, in June. So it was, it, was, uh, it was like trees and it was nice weather. Um, but yeah, I'm interested in these spaces that are, you know, for recreation and for inspiration, you know, where people go to be inspired in nature. So uh, I created this layered photograph. Um, I started experimenting more with, with um, in Photoshop with like layering images and having parts of an image come through. And I felt like I really enjoyed that kind of push-pull between the two. And the act of being in that place and photographing the falls from many different dimensions kind of created this uh, interest in me to work with all of those photographs. So this was after, later on, after that Hudson project, um, I went back to my archive of those photographs and I worked on a picture where I combined multiple images uh, from the same general space, uh, but different moments in time, into uh, a sort of composite photograph of um, many moments in time in one view. So this is a, became the start of this project that uh, is my most recent work. 
So this is a detail of that where you can see uh, different parts of the photograph coming through, or different parts of many photographs coming through the other photographs. And there's jagged edges because I'm using, um, I'm, I'm kind of leveraging software that's in, intended to uh, create composites and stitch and, and create seamless composites. And I'm sort of misusing that software. So I found a way to kind of make it my own and uh, leverage those tools, but in a way that felt more interesting to me. So I started thinking more about cubism and having you know, multiple views in, a, in an image and multiple moments in time and thinking about just all of those, those images that I create and that we create. And I think it has a lot to do with using a digital camera now and just kind of being in this, this world where we're it's photography is everywhere. And I started uh, applying it to different uh, images from my archive because this was actually uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So I guess I had started it right before the pandemic, but then once the pandemic started, I was home with my children who had school and I was doing Zoom learning and I was not able to go to my studio and work physically. So I thought I'm going to like dive into this project because it's actually where my mind is at, you know, I'm feeling like we're in a digital world right now. The only way to connect is through computers and, you know, I just feel like that is what's going on. So uh, I made this photograph with a, a few different views of uh, the landscape coming through. This is in Tecate. It's uh, on the Mexico side looking back towards California and there's the border wall is, is in here, there, and in many places. But thinking about kind of um, natural boundaries of mountains and then the kind of artificial boundaries that we create. And this photograph is also just a more simple um, view. Uh, this was just made from two photographs, or maybe three, but um, it has a, uh, there's, the way that the, the software I'm using is working is that it's, the way compositing software works is that it's designed to kind of seek out the, f the features to match um, the image below it. So it's looking for like um, objects to break apart. So it's almost working in a similar way that camouflage works, I th which I think is interesting. It's just that idea of like, it doesn't want to show you the edges of something when it's blended, so it's not going to cut out something exactly. It's going to kind of like break it apart so that you won't notice. And then it'll, it would use like, you know, it would use like softening filters to create seamless edges, but I'm using it to show the edges, so. Um, but I thought it was interesting how the space starts looking like camouflage, which kind of fools your eye gets you like looking into it a little longer before you can kind of know what's going on. And this is in Yosemite. This is a popular view spot and I, you know, I've. Uh, so the subject is often the same of me going to these spots where people go to enjoy nature and appreciate nature, like national parks, um, regional parks, just, you know, outdoors. Uh, and thinking also about that kind of idea of time in a photograph, right? Multiple moments in time, but then also deep time, you know, Yosemite Valley being created 200 million years ago and, and kind of the rocks on the ground breaking apart and just thinking about how humans in this day and age and this Anthropocene are, you know, speeding up these processes and that they're becoming more visible. Uh, and this is also a spot called Rainbow Falls in, in Hawaii. And I was thinking about tourism and kind of that global, global culture, but then also the different kinds of plant species that come together on the island, native, non-native. And that's a detail that I love. I love how this process tends to prioritize shoes and feet. And I just feel like it's really, I always get really excited about that. Uh, this is just a, a visualization of, of the scale of the pieces because uh, I've been printing them very pretty large because they are just very detailed. And there's all these little details that if I print them smaller, they get lost. And that is a challenge with sharing the work 
on my website or sharing it, you know, uh, digitally, I guess. So I'm working on that. I'm still considering it. I consider this work to be in progress, so it's not, um, yeah, there's a lot of things I'm still thinking through. And this is uh, my version of like tourists descending a staircase or ascending a staircase. But uh, yeah, so this, I, I was thinking about these, these repetitions and uh, moments, the, the kind of repeating palms and the, the person down on the beach with the, you know, taking selfies and their arm up and down. I thought I had a, de oh, I have a detail, but they went out of order, sorry. So here's the detail of that one. Um, you can see the people. And this is another uh, view from also, these, are, these were made in Mexico. So right before the pandemic started, I had taken a trip to, a, to the Riviera in Mexico and photographed a lot of these spaces where you know, they, they were heavily, tourist, heavily touristed, um, but also these beautiful uh, spaces and ruins. So I was really interested in the, the kind of mixture of the old and new. And also kind of getting a little bit more wild with the, the uh, creations I was making. So to, to make these photographs, I, I select a subset of images. Uh, you know, I, I decide which images to put in to this uh, process. And then uh, I can, once it, it's sort of a generative process. So I can create, um, I don't know, hundreds of images with different parameters. And then I can kind of do a little curator, curatorial edge, you know, editing and figure out what I like. And then I, I can also go into the each layer and tweak it and change it. So um, there's a lot of possibilities. But I liked this kind of getting a little bit more full and, uh, and having more, more uh, different kinds of images mixed together, not just different moments from the same place. So I like this detail of the, the person's little bit of their phone sticking out in the middle. Uh, so I got, I got more interested in, these, in making these photographs and then taking these and regenerating images with those and creating something very complex. Um, this one's called Cobra Ruins and it's made from hundreds of photographs, um, like a subset of which would, would look like, like this. Like they're not that interesting photographs, some of them maybe, but you know, they're taken as a whole, it was sort of about an experience of being in the place. You know, there's architecture and there's the, the you know, blue skies and there's the ruins. So uh, it's not that easy to see at this <laughs> projected, but there are a lot of like crisp details and little details you can see of, of things. And so that's a pretty large piece. It's, you know, 80 inches. And here's a detail that shows some of the um, but so this is at, it's at Koba Ruins, which is uh, in the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula, and it's, um, it's an old Mayan ruins from 600 to 900, I think, and it was just recently rediscovered, you know, in the 70s and uncovered. So only about 5% of the ruins have been uncovered. The rest is still under thick jungle and, you know, can see kind of mounds and things, places where they think that there's more and they'll do more excavating. But I was thinking about that, about that history of this kind of mysterious uncovering, but also just the way that the, that the, uh, the area is supported by tourism and the built environment. This is just a little visualization of like zooming in, just to show scale. <laughs> and I like that you can zoom way in on a pixel. Okay, so I won't make you watch it twice. Um, so I also have spent more time in California photographing fragile environments there. So this is in Joshua Tree. And thinking about during the pandemic how, uh, you know, when the parks closed and uh, there was a lot of damage done to these trees that are, you know, often already dying because of the warming climate. But also just thinking about how, I don't know if it's this mythology, but we tend to think of the desert as being very hardy and desolate. 
but it's just filled with this, you know, biodiversity and systems that depend on each other. I think that the work, I'll, the way I'm creating these, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about all of those things. And this picture is also um, made in and around California in the Sierras, and also um, I started pulling in um, bits of graffiti and um, textures from the ground and just kind of getting a little bit more loose with color and play. And similarly in this one, this has more of the photographs I've made in and around the fire zones in California. So there's these kind of burnt areas inside the picture. I find it really difficult to just make straight photographs of the, the um, fires, fire zones. They're just, they're, it's really, um, it just feels like an intrusion. So I, I don't, I don't know, unless I was, you know, working for the New York Times or I don't know, a journalist going in and, and making those kind of stories, which I'm not. So um, I'm finding my own way to kind of approach that and feeling like all of these bits of things are coming together, you know, the, the different elements and the imbalance that's going on. And that's a detail. And I'm also thinking about my mind and uh, the distractions I feel constantly and the constant fragmentation that's going on in, our, in with attention and in our lives. And uh, as a mom, I have two daughters and they were with me this day when I was photographing on the beach and found this uh, seagull. And, you know, just kind of that whole experience of being in more than one place at once. So I ended up using a lot of photographs of my daughters blended with this image of the bird. And so there's pieces of hair and buttons and other elements. And just kind of thinking about it more as a portrait of that kind of experience of a place and being in more than one place uh, in our minds or being on our phones and being, you know, being somewhere but being somewhere else. Which has kind of brought me back to trying to make somewhat simpler photos. So <laughs> I have um, returned to the coast recently and I mean I don't live far from the coast but when I say returned I mean returned as a subject like I'm often there photographing or just hiking, but you know, as far as like making an effort to make work regarding that or using the water and the waves as like the patterns and wave interference. So thinking about the energy of how two waves cancel each other out and just kind of feeling about feeling feeling the space of the photograph a little bit more. Here's a detail of that. And then um, here's another one from that coastal series of uh, a, s a rock along the coast. And the, the air is gray because it's, uh, it was really foggy that day, but it was also, uh, s it was smoky. So it was a, a one of those really poor air quality days where it felt like it was hard to breathe. Like you just, like you can't, you can't go to the coast and have like fresh sea air, you know, because the smoke was actually coming down the coast and then coming in off the coast. Um, so yeah, just kind of feeling that experience of being in these places in this moment and feeling like it's very complex and complicated. And I think that my, I think with all the photographs I make throughout the last you know, 20 years, it's always been like this record of experience, but also how can I convey the emotions I'm feeling at the time and what's the best format for it? What's the best material or process? Um, within photography, because that's <laughs> what I love. So uh, with this work, I'm thinking a little bit more about, you know, other ways to picture it and picture the layers. So I just recently made this uh, visualization kind of with help of, of pulling the layers apart and thinking about this maybe as not a print, but some sort of other kind of experience. Um, we'll see. I don't know. It's this is a first attempt, so it could be it could go nowhere, but you get to see it. <laughs>
Yeah, so yeah, so just thinking a little bit more about that because you know it's digital and it doesn't have to be printed, but it could be printed and it could be something else, so we'll see. We'll try to be more open. But um, yeah, so that's, that's what I've got for you tonight. <laughs> Thank you. So I probably forgot to say a lot of things that I wanted to say, but if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to talk more about anything. Any questions? <laughs> um, thanks, that was a really awesome presentation that you're, you're like linear, linear nest to like where you started and where you ended is was really really helpful insightful um which which kind of brings me to this question um there is this like kind of ever exploring this happening with a lot of your work and obviously it came from your background maybe in art history i, I guess i'm just curious to know if you do have like a an endpoint, or if, if if or if your process is never ending, um, in in the, your continuousness and exploring these these images. Yeah, I do not have an endpoint until I have an endpoint. You know, <laughs> no, I feel like um, that's a really good question because that's often something I struggle with, is knowing when something is done or finished. I mean, that's like always the question we all struggle with, right? Um, but. That's I, probably why I keep saying things are ongoing, like response series. I have a couple I didn't show you tonight that are that didn't fit in, but I made them last year. You know, they're of mountains. I'm going to work on the iteration of it with mountains. Um, I photographed in, in Donner and in uh, in Yosemite with with mountains. So, um, but yeah, so that's obviously an older project that I've returned to, and I'm returning to it in a different. A slightly different way, you know, with the different tools that I have now and the different knowledge that I bring to it and the different person that I am, right? When I first started, I was in grad school and then I, like, somewhere along the way, had two, two daughters, became a mom, and my life changed a lot. And I think it's always about returning to the landscape and the work in the place I am in now. And so, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm still working on this work, but I'm not sure, I, I don't feel like digital is my only path or this is where I'm going to go and I'm just going to keep going deeper into the meta first because I'm not. <laughs> I hope. I hope not. Uh, no, I, I actually am doing a lot with um, with materials and working with encaustics in my studio right now and making terrible tests. So that's, I hope that they'll be better in like a year and we'll see. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I do feel like it's a, it's always a, a question of responding in my case, because I the way I photograph is all about discovery. I, I want to be a very conceptual photography photographer who has all of my ideas, you know, and can be very organized, but the truth is that I go out and I get inspired by something. And when I get stuck, the only way to get unstuck is to like go on a walk or go somewhere and be in nature and walk around and explore and look through my camera and then bring those back to the studio and maybe print them out and see how they work with other things and just kind of play around and make a lot of bad tests. I mean, there's tons of work that I didn't, sh I wouldn't share because it's just failed tests for different processes and yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. No, yeah, yeah, so okay. it does, thanks. Thank, thank you for asking. <laughs> Any other questions? Ooh, Diana. Diana. I'm just curious because for physical manipulating, it feels like you can control like every specific small things and you kind of can imagine how it will look like. Mm -hmm. But for like digiting, digital collage and manipulation, it's more like having it into the program. So you said you can like get to choose, but still you don't roughly, you only have roughly an idea how it will look like. Right. So I'm, um, curious how you think about those like different processes and also I want to know if you are thinking of mixing those two processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question because I, I 
So one of the things I really like about this, the working with the digital collages is that they are surprising to me and there's a lot of chance involved and things do not turn out the way I think they will. You know, I might have a photograph of, you know, this one thing and then, I don't know, the, the software like prioritizes this like, I don't know, little thing in the corner of the photograph, you know, that I didn't notice. And so it becomes very like um, democratic almost in how it's united. And so what I d decided I liked that about it being one surface and one uh, photograph, like it's connecting pieces. So early on when I first made the Catterskill Falls image and I did uh, experiment with printing and cutting out pieces and like layering them, but then it was becoming more of this dimensional, like that there's a background and that there's uh, things on top and it just, it, it didn't feel integrated. Mm -hmm. And then re-photographing them just lost quality. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do that because I was really into these little details that it show up, you know, and they just, they were getting lost. So it, for me, it's a lot about that fabric and those little particles and details. Um, but I am curious to see if there's ways that I can do it. I'm still kind of ex exploring that. Because I do love going back and forth between analog and digital and combining things. But I think if, as far as just purely compositing work, I, I mean, I'm, I, can, we, I know how to do that, we can do that, but I don't enjoy that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I like the element of surprise and chance. And so I'm actually trying to find more ways to introduce chance into the work and have it be a collaboration between myself and chance because you know I want to say also I want to like <laughs> I want to have some control but also just let more things be random because that's kind of a reflection of the way life is you know all the things I try to control or it doesn't work out so um, did I did I answer everything yeah, sure because um, I might have gotten yeah sure um, lost um, I have one more. Yeah, go ahead. Just, yeah, um, because I'm curious how you decide to group your photographs, because I'm curious if it's based on your emotion at that time, or mm -hmm. is it based on just like geographical aspects? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I have like an archive of photograph here, so mm -hmm. I'm just gonna throw them all together, or mm -hmm. yeah. You mean with the newer When pictures? you like group it into that program and okay, decide yeah. how much photographs right. you're gonna group, yeah. Right, right, so yeah, so there's been a lot of experimenting. So sometimes I'm like, okay, well, I have, yeah, Catterskill Falls, there was pictures from all different points of view. Mm -hmm. And what I liked was having a dynamic subject. So people moving through the space, mm -hmm. I thought worked well with the, the landscape that was, you know, solid, not moving. So in those cases, I liked using photos that were all, you know, kind of from the same area and showed this kind of movement through the space. Um, but then as I went on and I started being a little bit more loose and free, it was definitely um, sometimes pretty random. And then I realized that didn't work so well because it was like too crazy or too random or didn't make any sense. So I've kind of pulled back to it being more about like, okay, there's this image I wanna work with and let's see if I can, you know, bring in a few viewpoints of that so that it becomes dominant mm -hmm. and then maybe introduce a few little extra things, you know, like people over here or some you know picture of graffiti that I photograph because I tend to photograph still out in the world just um, I, I still tend to photograph like a documentarian or mm -hmm. a new topographics photographer I still I still go out there and I make kind of pretty straight photographs you know it's just that I, when I get back to my studio I'm not satisfied with them so I, I've started thinking of them more as raw material mm -hmm. than finished final prints yeah so I'm shooting in a way d in, in a very different way mm -hmm. now that I feel like I'm like I'm a gatherer than when I was just, you know, out there making one photograph at a time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about how you, you go and make these straight photographs, but then when you take them back to the studio, you know, you, you sort of work with them. Do you find that working in this way has sort of changed your relationship with, uh, with photography, with images, and maybe you don't appreciate the straight photo as much as you did when you first started? Yeah, yeah, I think, yes, and I think it, ha well, I still appreciate other people's straight photographs, let me just say that. I love all kinds of photography and all genres, and I, 
admire so many artists out there who are doing different things, and I, I just love looking at work. With my own photographs, there are definitely ones that I'm, when I'm editing, I you know, edit in Lightroom or whatever, I will star a few that are like, oh, I love this. You know, so it's still kind of the same thing, whereas you could shoot rolls of film and get like one that you like, right? So I still have those, and I've thought about maybe just bringing in some straight photographs, but we'll, I haven't yet. But I think it has changed. I think it has a lot to do with tools that I'm using. I, I'm using a medium format digital camera now. It's great for resolution, and but I just I don't love it. It's not like I just I don't feel attached to it in the way that I used to with my film cameras. But for a lot of reasons, I switched to digital and and haven't gone back to film, even though I still have them in my cupboard because I won't let them go. And I have expired film, and I have someday I'll make an expired film project, and you know all that. But um, yeah, I think it it just it has a different feel for the way it translates space, this camera, and the, or at least the lenses I have. I don't know, maybe I need to just change it up. But um, I think I haven't really loved it. And maybe that played into how I felt more free to just kind of fragment the images. I don't know. But I did use that for the Hudson work, which I, those were all straight photographs. So I don't know, maybe I'm, it's just a mood thing, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I do think that, like, you know, just the way we photograph now with our cameras everywhere does change our relationship to photography. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so I was going to ask another question, but you, you sort of answered it. So you don't usually shoot your 4x5 analog anymore? I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. Um, yeah, because the workflow doesn't work for me as a mom with two little uh -huh. daughters. Like, it's, you know, I cannot, uh, well, shooting is one thing. But then, you know, getting a single shot, getting it processed, and then getting a really good scan made, and it was just financially really hard, too. So I hate to make decisions like that, but for, you know, when I had two young kids, it was like, no, I need a workflow that's going to work for me. And so that does dictate how, you know, I've worked in the past. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't return to it, but there are things I don't enjoy about that. Um, I do feel like the digital has better resolution and I do enjoy printing big to kind of open up and have a, a different relationship to scale into the space. Um, and yeah, and like having to get a scan and spot tone all that dust and I don't, yeah. <laughs> I'm not very patient anymore. <laughs> Save it, I, I try to be patient with my children and then I, <laughs> I, got not, I don't have enough left. So, thank you. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you, Lara. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation. Um, so it's really impressive when you're showing a image of a seagulls in a on a, a fragmentized seagulls picture and then you mentioned about the um the relationship of between you and your daughters and your um your thought and then um so does does this is emotional or more inner inner part that affects more in your picture and then how do you translate them like visually by visual language? I want to know more about the pre-production yeah. idea. Yeah, and well, I've just started using more pictures that have my daughters uh, in them, although they're not really in them, they're just little bits. Um, because I'm always photographing my children and those are not my photos I consider to be my art right, but we're always photographing, right? Um, and I think I'm, I, I don't know, for so long I've kept my work much more um, detached from, I mean, there's always been like personal story, right, family, et cetera, but um, when I had my daughters, I was in the middle, of, or it was, af it was like response series after graduate school, um, and 
that never really entered into the conversation. You know, I felt like there wasn't a lot of support for being a mom and being an artist in the art world. And I do feel like that conversation is opening up a little bit more now, or maybe it's something that, that needs to. So I feel like it's also very much a part of where I'm at right now. And with the pandemic and the blurring of the boundaries between like, you know, work and home and, you know, they were, they were home learning and I was trying to work in the same space and we were all on top of each other. And I just feel like that kind of opened up something for me as far as like, I can't ignore this anymore. <laughs> this is here, you know, we're a part of this. So I, I, I've made some where I've photographed their art and like made these kind of wild collages that are very colorful with it, but I, I haven't quite figured out how those fit in because they're not landscapes, they're more like studio constructions and, um, and I might do something with them. But also just, yeah, I, it is hard to, to figure out how to, to translate that emotion into the work, you know? So for me, it's like, I want it to be in there, but it doesn't have to be front and center. So it's more like, I don't know, the little bits feel like it's okay and maybe uh, through the title you know maybe it's like I can I haven't figured out all the titles for these for all of them yet but I'm thinking of doing that you know like incorporating different things that are in them into one title which would be really long so then it might be annoying so we'll see yeah that's sweet um thank you thank and you I have an extra question sure so um it sounds like you're it's really challenging when you're balancing the um, the relationship of your family and then your work and then like how would you like what is uh, I'm still thinking <laughs> and I'm once again um, so yeah what's the most like challengement or how would you like separate them? I don't know what I'm asking. <laughs> so, so, so just to, are you asking if? Yeah. How do you like? Um, how do you push your work more of not direct to your parentship than your work feel? So how do you deal with the, all the? How do I deal with all the, the chaos of work life balance? And all yes, that? yes, yes. Hmm. Well, now they're back in school, so that <laughs> so that helps. That helps a lot. Um, but it's not easy. I mean, as you know, there's it, there's such grad school is such a magical time. So appreciate it. Just being with your cohort, being with your community, and. Um, and having that space and time, which, you know, everything gets busier. I, I taught some after school and then I, after I graduated and then I have done other odd jobs and I do odd photo jobs and, um, yeah, it just, choosing to have a family is, is definitely adds complexity to life, but it makes it so rich. So I'm very happy to be on that path. Um, but I think it's just about setting boundaries and creating, carving space for yourself, which I'm really bad at. So, <laughs> I mean, the boundary part. But I, I know that it works for other artists because I have a, a lot of critique groups that I'm a part of. That's really important when you're, you know, when you get out of school is to keep community. So be involved with other groups. And I have one that's just artists who are moms too, which is really helpful. Um, in the Bay Area, and yeah, I think just, I just try to remind myself to keep going. I, I Things get done a lot more slowly than I wish. Like sometimes I run out of time in the studio and have to go pick someone up or, you know, do the things. But that's, I just try to pick it up back the next day, you know. Having a routine and a schedule really helps. But then, you know, I'm also like, I spent some time being a caregiver to my father when he was sick years ago. And like, you, you know, so your role as like a child and a parent, if you're close to your family, it's, it's part of life. So you, I don't know. For me, that always comes first. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Laura? Okay, well, thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>